Hey everybody, it's your host Lee with Heavy Art Talk, I believe episode 12, maybe 13, doesn't really matter, but I have uh, my guest here, Daniel Shaw, who goes by the name, the pen name, uh, Sawblade666. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen his work as he's been uh, very prolific and he's been an illustrator since 1995. Uh, but yeah, Daniel, how's your week been overall? Oh, it's been great, Lee. Thanks for having me on. Um, went to a cool show last night. Um, I'm still on vacation, so I'm kind of taking it easy. But I saw Ruin uh, from California. Nice. And one of my favorite local bands opened up, uh, HRA. They haven't played in four years, so I had to go go check them out. So, Did you get that yeah. shirt from the show? Yeah, sure did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ruin is that the uh death metal band or is it a different ruin uh death metal band from uh uh la yeah okay yeah i think i have one of their releases the um i was sick it's like yeah. transmissions there's like the transmissions yeah it's a, too. it's a i think it's a comp of their stuff yeah yeah it's a pretty killer comp good stuff well, cool, man. So you're on vacation. You had uh, your girlfriend travel over from the UK. Um, yep. How, how long was the vacation overall? Uh, you're winding down. Uh, I picked Abby up on the 31st, um, and she flew out back home on the, the 14th. So it was two weeks. Uh, nice. She goes by Abby Stabby on Instagram. Check her out. She does awesome caricatures and cartooning and uh, has done all kinds of stuff. Like um, she just uh, designed a bobblehead for the I saw um, that. the fest and, and uh, the Bloodstock Fest. It's huge. So that, that's so awesome. I'm excited for. Um, but yeah, we hung out. We, you know, did a couple pieces of art some small collabs uh talked art <laughs> uh shop for comic books i mean we we had a great time that's so, the dream yeah well, nice and uh what part of the uk is she from she's uh she's from a small town called hornsey uk which is by hull um it's north northern part northeast i think of the uk so, um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I plan to visit one day. So yeah, that'd be pretty cool. How did, how did yeah. you guys end up meeting then just online naturally or. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I, I think for her, it was a slow evolution of first discovering my art through, I believe an insect warfare hoodie that her friend loaned her. And then from there, it's kind of funny, um, different friends or, or um, even a, a couple people she dated uh, had bands that I had done either a logo for or, or small piece of art and then, you know, started following me on Instagram for years. She's, she's been uh, following. I would see her name pop up in comments a lot and, um, but she... Um, Recently, Abby started, um, I do this with everybody. I always thank everybody who shares my work. It doesn't matter if it's five people or 50 or 100. I'll personally thank, go down the list to my, you know, DMs and thank everybody. Yeah. And I came across her and I, I we just started talking. I, I you know, it just we have a lot in common and um yeah one thing led to another and here we are you know we've been been together a little over six months seven nice. eight months now yeah so well, that's great, great that you guys got to meet and um you have that shared interest in art and not only art but like dark art and you know culture all related to it all kinds of art um yeah yeah, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, anything from ancient art to, you know, what's going on currently with illustration. Um, we're just all over the place and obsessive about drawing in particular, you know, 
um, that's been my passion since day one. And, you know, same with her. So we get along great. That's awesome. That's all we yeah. talk about. <laughs> Who knew that uh, a grindcore band like Insect Warfare would, you know, bring romantic interests together? It's uh, <laughs> it, it's really odd, man. That that work in particular has brought me a lot of things. Um, I, I often wonder sometimes um, how it would be if I if I hadn't uh, done any of that because, in a way, it kind of put me on the map. Uh, because I, I had been doing art or trying to do art for bands prior to that, but it just didn't click until they came along mm -hmm. and, and really gave me a chance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, before social media, it came along. Uh, it, we just had email. <laughs> Once I did that work, man, my, my inbox was full a request request um and it just never stopped That's so awesome. it, it it definitely opened a lot of doors for me so i'm grateful they gave me a chance you know definitely and and for a long time you were working a, a full-time job and doing art more on the side but ever since 2019 i believe you've made art full-time is, is that correct yeah that's right um I'd always had a part-time job up until 2019. So yeah, I, I it, it, and it was everything you could think of, man. I mean, from retail, construction, warehouse, um, just anything, anything you could think of, uh, machine shops, uh, delivery, driving. Um, you see the it thing all. about uh, yeah yeah and i even you know delved into tattooing for a few years and found out you know that wasn't quite my thing at that time um the point is is like all these failed you know miserably i, I don't do well in a nine to five schedule punching a clock on you know, someone else's time. Mm -hmm. So the goal was always to take what I do on paper and make that my living because I don't mind work. It just has to be the work that I want to do. I know that sounds, you know, um, I don't want to say, uh, you know, naive or, <laughs> or arrogant or any of those things, but, I was just had it. I was dead set on that goal, and it's happened. Um, but what pushed me in 2019 to really dive into it was a back injury. I was throwing around 80 pound bags of cement, and I threw out my back, and was literally on my back in a bed for almost a week. I couldn't move. Yeah. So. Uh, you one day after looking for jobs online, which kind of slowly be, was starting to become my job, I decided, um, man, fuck this. I'm just going to draw my ass off. Once I got better and could actually sit in a chair, <laughs> uh, I just started drawing my ass off and posting. I, I didn't know where I was going with it or what I was going to do, but the idea was, was just to crank out work and sell what I could and get any opportunities um, and you know, here we are, it's gotten to where now I've winding it down with accepting commissions and just focusing on, you know, here's what I do. Take, yeah. You know, take that, <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, um, it's been a wild ride, man. I mean, I You've been at it since '95, right? So that's nuts. With with, with what I'm doing now, yes, yeah, since '95. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually started my professional career in '93 because uh, right before I graduated high school, I got the opportunity to to design a um, a safety manual and uh, spot illustrations uh, 
for Chevron Oil and uh, a small PR firm went to my high school kind of looking around for for talent that, that was there and I basically just you know you know in a weird way kind of kind of won a contest in a way yeah and and uh, I ended up working with that company like right after high school um, full t- well at first it was part time and then developed into a full time job for a couple years and then after that it was just uh freelance uh all kinds of stuff man so that that artwork in particular or that job in particular didn't deal with too much of what I'm doing today right. um when I wasn't doing that stuff I was focused on trying to get into the comic book industry and found out that uh doing a page a day you know at 50 to 100 dollars a page just wasn't quite uh i wasn't fast enough so um you really respect that work when you find out what what goes into it you know um were you a penciler or an anchor at the time then in terms of what you Uh, were uh, commissioned for uh, I was trying to get in as a penciler. I sent tons of submissions to all the major companies and a lot of un- did a couple of underground things at that time. We're talking mid nineties, early that to mid nineties before the crash, the speculator related crash. Right, right at the beginning of it. Okay. Uh, but I was submitting stuff before during the boom. You know. Um, yeah. Before all that, though, I'd always had an interest in comics. Um, it's just until I started getting um, a lot more professional work, graphic art and you know other types of illustration, I thought, well, you know, this stuff's cool, but I'd like to do something more in line with what I'm interested in. So I, I kind of hit those, the submissions hard with that. And it just didn't work out. But... Uh, Around 95 is when I kind of looked at music. I was like, ah, well, you know, let me uh, let me go back to trying to see if bands will let me do stuff for them. Because I had tried a few times, even during the early 90s, to try to <laughs> get in on it. And it just didn't, it didn't ever work out. You know, I sent a few things to some zines that didn't, I don't think, got used. Um. I was a little intimidated by it too, you know, Mm -hmm. for, for whatever reason, I've always been kind of a awkward, shy kid, you know, back then. So always on the outskirts looking in, you know, and, um, but in 95, I had some friends that, you know, were in different bands and, um, I do flyers for different gigs or parties or, you know, I think I, you know, I had a friend who had a little record store, which is basically a, a space he rented to put his record collection in. And I did some flyers for that. And so, yeah, it started really like, um, yeah, it's just really uh, humble beginnings, really. You know, hey, draw me this for 40 bucks in a case of beer, you know, when I'm like 19, 20 years old. So, yeah, I mean, it was that kind of stuff. But then, like I said, it wasn't until Insect Warfare came along, which was years later. I mean, we're talking, um, you know, throughout the late 90s into the early 2000s to like 2004. Mm-hmm. Those guys came to me and I knew one of them from more of the death metal scene, really. And he was like, man, I've always liked your stuff, you know can you do a seven inch cover for us? And I'd already seen, uh, I've already attended one of their shows and I was already all over it. I was like, absolutely. Well, they're so, a local band. I don't know if they're in Houston, but they're Texas. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. in Houston. Yeah. Okay. Or, or were, <laughs> yeah. 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 Great band. Um, uh, 
I mean, those are crazy times that period. Uh, so, I mean, I remember seeing the, um, you know, the, the cover that you did at the time and that just blew me away. And I was, you know, which still, one? The, um, I'm sorry. World Extermination? Yeah, World Extermination. I wanted to say that, but I don't want to say it wrong. Um, but yeah, World Extermination is what I was familiar with. And that was when, um, you know, I was trying to stay up to date with like the earache releases at the time. Because that did come out on earache, right? Later. Uh, the, the, it first came out on a label called six, uh, 625 okay. Thrash. Yeah. And then, uh, it came out on another one. I, I can't remember. There's been that records have been pressed so many different times. Um, mm -hmm. It's gotten into thousands of pressings. Um, but yeah, Earache initially came along later to to license it out. Um, which, if I'm not mistaken, they gave that release a special Mosh number, which was originally supposed to be for Sore Throat if I'm not mistaken, which was bad, you know, <laughs> that's so amazing to me, but we were all old earache freaks. And, and so that, that was just more of a symbolic move on their part, you know, uh, just an ode to that old earache stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I saw the cover, I like it. You, I imagine you know, when you're getting into metal and stuff, because I was in, um, you know, early high school, maybe in late middle school when I saw the cover. And that was oh, most, that's a trip to me, dude. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> yeah. <Maybe people. laughs> yeah, that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I remember the music. It was too it was too extreme for me at the time, but I loved the cover. And I, it's like uh, I wanted to like the music more because I like the cover so much. And I right. find that sometimes that's how it is for people getting into metal, you know, when they are like a younger teenager and stuff. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, if we can, maybe go back to like childhood then. So pre all that, you know, what, what were some of your earliest memories in terms of like drawing and what you were creating? What inspired you? Oh, man. Um that's a good question. It, it's kind of, it's kind of all over the place, man. Um, I was really, really into superhero stuff. Um, yeah, I drew all the normal stuff that kids do just, you know, monsters and, uh, the stuff that was on TV at the time. Um, a lot of fantasy stuff in the early eighties. So I was mm -hmm. always drawn to, to whatever was going on in that world. It didn't matter if it was from, you know, He-Man to, to the first Conan movie. Um, you know, a lot of stuff like that. Um, Mad Max, uh, Blade Runner, all the sci-fi of the time. So those things inspired me to draw comics, comic strips. I would actually, when I was very young would trace you know i'd get the, the the sunday paper from my dad to get the comics part after he was done and i would look and try to draw some of those things in there you know everything from prince valiant to dick tracy and um you know hell even garfield i mean <laughs> yeah. so i was just kind of all over the place I always loved animation and cartooning and um yeah, it just kind of, it was just what it was all over the place. So I was all constantly drawing. Yeah. As far as like um, picking up comic books and stuff from like the store, do you have any like vivid memories of, you know, maybe covers that kind of just blew you away and you like had to buy it? You had to convince your mom or dad to, you know, put it in the grocery cart or something? Uh, yeah. The first, my first real, um, I, I knew about comics before this, but my the, the, when the bug really hit me was when we were at an airport. My grandmother um, let us pick out me and my brother pick out a couple of comics, and and I 
I realized my mistake when I, I picked up a Transformers comic. We're, t- we're talking, this is 84. This yeah. is 1984. I'm probably eight or nine. And I picked up a Transformers com- comic, and my brother picked up Superman, the newest Superman that was on the rack. And it's not that it had an incredible cover or anything, but the drawing in it, I was just so uh, mesmerized by it. And um, I hung on to that. I actually kind of forced him to trade because I found out that that was really more of what figure drawing is what really spoke to me on that level and the action that was involved. The artist later I learned was Kurt Swan. And that was probably one of his later, um, you know, issues or his later work because he was actually a silver age artist, fifties and sixties. So, um, but yeah, that that's probably the earliest memory of where it just really clicked with me. Mm -hmm. Um, the medium. And it, like I say, it wasn't just comics of, of the time. It was definitely just illustrations, um, around that time I started seeing Frazetta didn't know who he was, but I, I, I saw the images and then later into, into the middle school and, and early high school years, I, I became a, you know, Frazetta freak. So are like you... many artists of my, you know, style and. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody yeah, looks up everybody. to Frazetta. Yeah. yeah. It's just a standard thing. Yeah. For good reason. So in terms of drawing, then you learned by uh, at a young age, like copying from some stuff, which is, is very common. Did you get any kind of like traditional art education or are you primarily self self-taught? Primarily self-taught when I was in high school, I went to, to a, um, uh, it was an advanced visual arts program. In fact, it was called ABA. And, uh, but it wasn't at all related to uh, what I do now. In fact, I don't, it sounds bad, but I don't think I use anything that they were trying to get me to learn uh, with what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a couple of art classes that I took after high school. I tried, I tried to get into what, well, you know, my dad was like, either you, you you go to um, you go to college or you get a job. So I tried community college, and then um, I tried the art institute for one semester. And but bo- both of those places had a couple of art teachers that I thought were really good, and I I kind of kind of got some things from a perspective class maybe, and um that's about it, man. It's very minimal with me. I, I, I don't do well really in a, a classroom setting too much. Um, mm-hmm. my learning kind of comes from doing so this again, back to, back to what I was saying before, everything that I've, that I'm doing today just comes from me, you know, doing it myself, trial and error. Um, I get books on stuff. Um, read up on a lot of things um you know artist interviews yeah uh, sure. that's what's cool about this but when, when i was um coming up i had to read them or try to find what magazine would would have whatever artists i was interested in which is very few and far between you know yeah so no that's that's really cool and um in terms of what you create now, so all pen and ink, uh, from my understanding. Yes. Um, you mind talking a little bit about like the process for just pick a, a random piece, like maybe what size of paper typically you work on, um, type of paper, tools, just like your kind of general grab bag. Uh. I prim- primarily work on Bristol paper. The size usually depends on what it's for. Mm-hmm. Um, 
or just whatever size I feel like working on at the time, if it's just going to be a piece uh, to either sell to a collector or just use for something of my own products, you know? Um, so the size just depends on what, what's going on with the, with the work afterwards. And then, um, Bristol paper, smooth Bristol paper, always. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll try other things, but typically it's, it's going to be Bristol paper or medium weight illustration board in some cases. Um, and that's about it for, you know, for my ink, um, I use, if, if I'm, if I'm doing any kind of brush work, I typically use, um, and that's when you dilute the ink down to get more of a gray effect. Are you talking about like that kind of more wash? No, it, well, there, there, yeah, there's several different things I use actually for the wash. I use, uh, uh, Sumi ink. Japanese okay. Yeah. Sumi ink. But then I'll use for my line work. Cause I, I do a lot of line work with brushes sometimes too. I, I uh, for my brush work, I'll use, uh, this Cory Nor ink, which is originally for, um, repeatograph graph pins, which I used to swear by, um, you actually fill the reservoir with the ink, you know? Mm, yeah. And, um, that was my, my go-to for years and years and years. And then I found that with as much as I draw every day, I couldn't keep up with the maintenance of those because you have to clean them okay. after each use because the ink will dry up in there and then they become worthless. They're, they're about 20, 25 bucks a piece for each size, you know, but the trick, it, the cool thing is, you, you know, they're refillable. Um, you get a really solid, consistent, precise line with these. Um, What's and, the tip like on that? It's a metal tip, um, and there's just different um, millimeters of sizes. I don't use these anymore. Every once in a while, I might break one out for some special occasion. But, man, as of right now, I'm just using what a lot of artists use is the typical micron, mm -hmm. different sizes uh, for my line work and hatching and stippling. What's good about these is you can kind of get brutal with them. And it's okay, you know, you just grab another one. Um, so it's Micron, it's my brushes and ink um, and and bristle paper, and that's about it. And a number two pencil for my rough layout. So and the number two, is it. that a, like a mechanical or do you do the, um, just like when you sharpen up? Either or, uh, number two is the grade, just, just a HB lead, yeah. you know. I just mm -hmm. take my, just take a, you know, this is my favorite right now. It's this Pentel quick mechanical pencil. Um, and just go to town, man. I do a rough sketch. And then when the sketch is wh where I like it, I just, I just go at it with ink, you know. Um, I sketch, um, I don't sketch very precise. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of loose. Sometimes I'll get certain things precise depending on what the project is, but for the most part, it's pretty loose. And I've found that, um, it, I don't know, it keeps that energy level up, I think, yeah. in the work. There's this, you know, even though there might be super detailed things going on, um, I feel that if the original underdrawing is loose it keeps it lively for me anyway you know i so. definitely agree yeah yeah keeping it like gestural to begin with because you you once you start dialing it in naturally it's going to lose some kinetic energy i'm speaking from my own experience so you have to start with as most as it'll go and then it starts to then get more refined and you know get the details in there right right yeah for sure how uh, small do you go with the microns then? Just because I have like a 
so I have the uh, shit. What is it? The one that's 0.2 millimeters, and I wonder sometimes if I'm just going too small and it's almost wasting time, and I should just go for more bold lines, even just up a little bit. Uh, it depends on on the work, or like on your piece and what you're going for. My go-to man, uh, I use them all, uh, and I use different brands too. But but um, you know, the, their newer chunky ones, the the zero eight to zero the, to the twelve are really nice for just you know if you want to have some thick line weights. But uh, mm -hmm. my go-to sizes, man, are the the zero zero five and the zero one. That's typically what I use just every single time to get the drawing going, you know, um, yeah. uh, especially for all my stipple stuff. I'll, I'll go to those two for sure. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to know. Cause I almost perceive. So what I, I'm working on like some ink pieces right now too. And I'll, uh, I'll have the point two, then point three, five. And then my point five is for my thicker lines. Unless then I'm blocking out black areas in which I'll use this. And then I love these uh, Tombow brush pens as well. Well, yeah, I use those. Um, yeah, I, I have different, uh, all kinds of brush pens. I like this big Faber Castell uh, oh, yeah, fat, fat brush tip for backgrounds and large black areas. Or if they get too big, you know, I'll just get grab a brush and dip in some ink and you know uh brush it in that way so you can really get some nice line work with the, it, it's worth the effort to try to try to learn how to ink with a brush yeah uh, because you can really get some nice uh, brush pens kind of some brush pen, pens offer offer that or close to it but but Nothing beats an actual sable hair brush for, for your brush line work. It took me about five years to, to get comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's worth, it's worth the effort. I don't use it for every, I don't use it every time, but there's certain pieces that require that, just that look, you know? Yeah. Um, especially with your older comic style, that was like an industry standard. You know, so I always tried to emulate. Um, I got that idea actually from, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist, um, uh, Mark Schultz. I've heard the he name, did, yeah. He did this comic called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. And um, he's he's like a, a love child of Wally Wood and Frank Frazetta as far as his inking's concerned, because that's exactly what his stuff looks like. And uh, I was showing some pages I did at a convention. It was probably like 97, 98. And he goes, man, this stuff's great, but you should ink with a brush. And I'm like, what? How? And he, he told me which one he uses and showed me a little bit. And I was like, oh, fuck, that looks hard. And it was, but it was worth worth the effort, you know, to, to learn it, you know. But... It's something just, I've been working on as well. I, I, I do use the Windsor and Newtons. Is that yeah. the Series 7? Yeah, I was using those for a while, and I noticed the, they may have changed. They've gotten – they may maybe they've gotten better. I found an old batch that I – or some old ones that I had that I hadn't busted out, and they're a lot better than the newer ones. Mm. But, um, yeah, Series 7, 2, or 3, or you could use um, – these uh Raphael uh, 840, 8404 series number two. So um, you keep it right around that two or three size. Typically. Two or three size is what what I like. Yeah, I think you. I, I find it to um, you know you could still get some like some of the super tiny hair thin lines to, to some fat chunky ones and just a you know flick of a wrist so mm -hmm. it's all it's all control you know you could take a big fat brush and still get some 
varied line weights, but um, it's just easier to get that wide range with the, the smaller ones, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So did you ever experiment with painting, watercolor, anything like that in your youth, or have you been pretty dedicated for a long time now to pen and ink? Pretty dedicated pen and ink. I've, I've, uh, I've experimented some with color throughout the years. Um, and maybe one day it'll leak into my work. I, I don't know. I um, was pretty headstrong with picking one thing and just going with that. And so far, that's what's worked. Mm -hmm. I think, um, not to say you can't, and you probably should, but jumping around a lot, if you don't have a consistent style, I think maybe people don't catch on to it. Uh, I wanted to, to um, just, just pick, pick one thing and then just try to push it as far as it'll go. And I've always been drawn to the contrast of, of uh, you can get with pen and ink and just the details too. Mm -hmm. um, not that you can't get detail with painting, but um, also, man, I, 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 I struggle with color. I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it sometimes. So, um, but yeah, I have, I've, I've done some things in color, especially for commercial stuff. Um, but in my own work, yeah, no, I mean, there might be some gray tonal values in there sometimes that I'll do get bust out some, you know, gray brush markers or, or, um, stuff like that, but, but, uh, no full color. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I love it. Like Don't get me wrong. I love, <laughs> obviously love, you know, full color art, but, uh, it's just for me, uh, I don't think it best represents my uh, my vision as to what I want to do with my drawing, basically. Yeah. Nice. And um, if we could talk a little bit about like the the business side, kind of currently, uh, and as long as you feel comfortable with it, yeah. Yeah. What are some of like the different revenue streams that you tackle now, and how does that kind of work? What I'm making? <laughs> no, 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 no. More uh, like, so you can make art by selling your originals. You can make art, I mean, make money oh, by oh, doing those things. Oh. So how do you diversify yeah. that? Um, well, I was um, up until it, well, just recently, I, I stopped taking uh, commissions for now so but before that it was commission work selling originals um and just whatever opportunity came my way i would take it but now it's um kind of become more streamlined because of uh you know different licensing opportunities and and um uh, selling my work to retailers like Spencer's. Um, so with that, with, with those royalties, what it's afforded me to do is to, to now focus on what I would like to do as far as offering um, my audience product, my own products and, and um, just focus on selling more original work. Also, I really like, just doing something and then selling it. Mm -hmm. um, the problem, that's not a problem. It's just um, the thing with commissions is that it's, even though it's still my artwork and I could still put my twist on it, becomes mine in a way, it's still somebody's idea. It's still somebody having some kind of control or influence. I, I've done that for years now. I'm not saying I'm better than it. I just want to kind of, move into focusing more on, on my, my vision and having opportunities like 
um, something like selling stuff through Spencer's has afforded me that opportunity now. So um, I'm kind of get well getting ready to jump on that as we speak. So um, that that's kind of where it's at. But yeah, that, those are the different revenue streams. You know, I think as a independent freelance artist, you know, commission work, um, work for, um, you know, publishers, different companies. Um, I would personally kind of stay away from doing stuff for the, uh, smaller, uh, independent, um, clothing brands and stuff because they're not able to really give you what you what you deserve on that end because they just don't have the the um the infrastructure yet you know mm -hmm. because the the ideal way to get paid for that is just through a percentage you know royalties per S unit uh, right purchase. and a lot of smaller places you know it's not their fault they're just getting off the ground but it's just it, it kind of find it unless it's something you want to do and it's just for fun and you know but uh but yeah man th those are th the main ways for me have, have been selling originals so I, I always encourage uh independent artists to try to hit that collector market you know put it out there and create a, a market for your stuff you know do you find that so you mentioned like collector market so do you have collectors and like a, somewhat of a relationship with them and they've bought like you know five to ten pieces of your work the same person or is it a lot that, of collectors it's over the years it's been about four or five people that have bought tons of stuff from me. <laughs> nice tons all right i mean i i i had one guy and yeah you build relationships with some of them you you know they you become friendly and acquainted and, and, um, you know, these people pay your living. I mean, that you make your living from them buying your stuff. And, um, but yeah, it's a handful of collectors. Uh, some have like, there's been some that a couple actually that have had to stop because they just run out of room. They don't have anything, you know, no wall space left to hang up stuff, you know, hang things. So, but yeah, um, that's that's mainly what it is. Um, you know, you just got a few diehard collectors that buy buy a ton of shit from you, and I mean, I I've had one guy. I mean that that was my that was my bread and butter for like over a year, maybe even two years of just him steadily buying stuff. So, and sometimes, you know, with those, it's like, Hey, could you, could you do this for me? Or could, you know, I've got this idea and I'll, I'll work with people like that in some cases, but I enjoy it more and I get more of a thrill out of it. I think when it's something that, that I just come up with and there's no other outside influence on it and you just sell it. Yeah. It's, it's a great feeling. I don't know. Not that the other isn't, but I just I want to go more towards, you know, I put something down on paper and then that's it. It's, you know, we're selling it as it is. So, And, and in terms of composition ideas and um, really just all of your sketches and stuff, do you use a sketchbook or how do you catalog those ideas and organize them so... Um, maybe you have a couple pieces in the drawing phase and then there's some of the inking and you're kind of juggling both. I'm just curious how you go about that. Man, that's a great question. <laughs> and I could, <laughs> this is, might be borderline embarrassing, but I, I, I actually like, Oh, I got to blow you up here. I, I actually write things down. Oh yeah. Just whatever, whatever scrap that I have. So I don't forget ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a sketchbook. I have several sketchbooks that I rotate that I don't draw in enough, but man, really, honestly, it's like separate pieces of paper that I'll, I might do a, a quick doodle or write it down 
so that I can, and I'll set it to the side where I can see it so that I can just pick one to start on. Um, but that's how I do it. Be before that, well, I've always done that method, but I, I'll have stuff floating around in my brain mm -hmm. for months. Oh, there's that thing again. I need to do that. It'll pop up in my head. I need to do that. So, but then I wonder how many have like drifted off, yeah, you know, into obscurity because I didn't write it down. Um, so that's how I do it. I keep my ideas on a list somewhere around me. Um, it's not that organized, but um, it's just how I've done it for years now. And um, some of them I get to, some of them I don't. Um, but yeah, no, that's I, pretty much I it. I can definitely relate there. How many pieces do you typically juggle at a time? Um, it could be two or more. Um, I try to not keep it over to, but sometimes there's been cases where I'll have four or five different things going on, you know, that I'll rotate. Um, I'm trying to, it's slowly like, you know, not becoming that way anymore. But when I was, um, just going down the line of commission, uh, pieces that's that's how i would do it get one sketched up go on to the next one get it sketched up and figured out and then down the line and then go back and start inking several in different stages yeah i've done that um i think it's better if, to focus on one and finish it and move on to the next one really though for me anyway mm -hmm. yeah Is there a part of the artistic process that you enjoy the most when it comes to actually creating the work? Like, do you enjoy sketching, kind of refining, penciling, inking? Is there something that gives you more joy? I would say um, in some cases, depending on what it is, I, I can really enjoy the process of drawing said image. But then... Um, sometimes I find refining it for inks can get kind of tedious and, 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 um, annoying, but the part that I really enjoy and live for is the actual rendering. When I get started with, with the ink, the process of, you know, putting a zillion dots down or cross hatching or figuring out my, I, I find enjoyment in establishing a light source you know, try mm -hmm. to decide where, where I'm going to put my heavy blacks and, and, um, you know, what I'm going to leave for negative space. I mean, I, I, you know, that, that can be fun. I could find that part at the light source and what part's <laughs> going to be maybe more of the flat so that I can, you know, rest. I find that to be some of the hardest stuff to do in terms of like problem solving. Mm. You feel like, You've just improved a lot at that gradually over the years, or is there I, like a particular moment I, where it clicked? It's interesting because I get, I hear that a lot, and um, I, I'm not sure why that's why why that's the most difficult for people because, um, and this is a very um, I see it covered a lot. I know in basic art classes it was covered. It's just basically like as you know wherever the light is coming from is where your, your brightest spot will be. Mm -hmm. And then it behind it will be the darkest. So I always keep that in mind. Sometimes if it gets too technical, you could sketch it in really lightly, kind of fill in and pencil where uh, your darkest spots will be. And then just follow through with the ink. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or would make it easier, but um, I just always keep that in mind, just where, where the position of my, my light source is and where it'll land on the object. Yeah, um, no, definitely. Uh, oh, and I, I think maybe when you, you're trying to juggle two different light sources, that's when you start to create oh, more challenges for yourself, you know, more. Oh, ab oh yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, that's true. If you, if you're getting into multiple light sources then yeah, 
that's when you're getting into, oh man, should I set something up and light it, you know, or look at something that's lit similarly to what you're thinking in your head. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like that can get challenging. Explosion yeah. behind you has a little bit of the backlight. So you'd have the white maybe um, along the edges, but then there's a frontal light as well, but maybe that frontal light's from the side. That that kind of stuff. I mean, but you kind of create it for yourself, right? It's like you made that decision to even do that. So sometimes I find right. myself getting in those traps of like making it more complicated than it needs to be, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've, I, I can find myself doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the last couple of years and stuff, has there been a particular facet of your art that you've been trying to improve on? Uh, let's say like perspective, different perspectives, different types of compositions. <laughs> Are you challenging yourself? I guess. Um, I think with every piece that I think of, there's that challenge. One of those things you've mentioned that you're always working on. So that's how that usually gets worked out. I don't intentionally go, okay, well now I'm going to, I probably should do this more, but I don't, um, you know, I don't go this month. I'm going to work on anatomy and just focus on that. It's just whenever a piece has, you know, say a, 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 a almost nude figure in it, well, then that's when I dive into let's let's really figure this out. How are these muscles going to look when this leg's, you know, uh, bent this way or he, the weight's here, or he's tense, you know, whatever. So I'll, I'll study that for that particular piece. Um which would would probably speed me up more if I would just focus on that all the time, but I don't. Um, I kind of just take it as it comes. If something involves uh, some intense perspective, man, I just go to my library on books that I have on perspective and kind of brush up on those things and, and, try it out you know um kind of you fudge grid things here out completely for perspective or do you kind of go off like an implied perspective uh i have grid things out before um a lot of times i kind of eyeball things yeah and i've noticed that <laughs> this is kind of weird i i've noticed uh, there's been times where i'll i'll eyeball something and then I'll put my points of perspective mm -hmm. and it, it's all, it's close. Like it's yeah. not perfect, but it's like, Oh, well, that's not that far off, you know? Um, and then I'll just leave it because sometimes the brain will brain's weird. It, you can tell when something's off, you can't quite describe it sometimes in certain things, but it can just tell, but then if it's close enough, I think that it just registers and it, you know, it works. Sometimes it's the, the dynamicism of the, or, or how dynamic something is, or it just works for that piece. It may be off, but if it just um, helps with the flow or the, the composition is just killer, I, I don't really see a need to keep it exact every time. Yeah, but it depends on what you're doing. I mean, if certain things just have to be a, a certain way, and that's where the challenges come in. You know, doing mm -hmm. a million fucking windows and you know, perfect in three point perspective or whatever that that can be a nightmare. You know, Definitely. or easy for some. It depends on you know. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. You know, but. Yeah, I, all those things, man. It's constantly trying to work on getting better at them. Yeah, that's the goal. And just it's never going to be. A, it's just a never-ending thing. You're going to constantly try to work on those things. Yeah. What about like uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit? So, 
it seems like we're both kind of collector minded people. So what are some of the things that you currently collect? Oh man. Um, it's really weird. I have like, I collect different things and on each one I'll go through phases where that's mm -hmm. all I'll obsess over and then I'll move on to the next. It's like a bunch of mini collections in one place besides my music, obviously, which I still collect not as hardcore as I used to on it, but it, like last night I picked up, you know, a CD and a seven inch. Um, I still pick up things here and there. Uh, not as obsessive about that though, these days, but one day, though, I may go back into just hardcore, obsessive record collecting. But besides records and stuff, uh, books, uh, graphic novels, art books, um, you know, I collect miniatures, build and paint miniatures, uh, wargaming miniatures. Um, yeah, man, uh, different old toys. Uh, figures, small statues. I'm into Godzilla. I collect a, nice. lot, yeah. a lot of Godzilla stuff. Um, you know, a lot of old kaiju. Those um, like some of like around. the seventies <laughs> toys and like earlier. Do you kind of go for the older toys? Seventy seventies and early eighties, because that's kind of like what I remember. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, for Godzilla for sure. It, uh, probably be show a period and then uh, i don't know not much was happening in the there's some in the 80s but yeah um just whatever i can get my hands on that really sparks that that creativity in my brain i'll i'll grab it i try to surround my space with everything i love you know yeah it's I'm very similar. cluttered in here <laughs> i'm very obsessive and i get fixated on things like uh if you have any um recent obsessions i'd love to see them but like something i've been obsessed with is like the european comics like oh, mobius yeah. and jouet so i've just been pouring over this is a um mid-70s dragon dream so roger dean's publishing oh, I love roger dean. yeah so this is uh, i love these dragon dream books from the 70s i feel like the print quality was just really really good and um I've just been obsessed with uh, Jouet's work, and oh, he's I mean, great. Yeah, it's it's been very inspiring for me um, trying to do something that taps some of the aspects that I like in that, and then doing my own thing too. But do you, do you find yourself obsessive over over um, one thing, and then then you'll move on to the next? And then you'll obsess over that, but you keep it all within like one huge collection, basically. You know, yeah. I don't ever get I don't ever get out of something completely. I'll just put it to the side for a while, then focus on something else, and then go back to it later. <laughs> that's, that's it's been very been. much like that. Yeah. Um, so up until like two years ago, I really didn't have many art books at all. But then I just started. That was my obsession has been my obsession the last two years is like acquiring art books both ones that are instructional so those are the more practical ones but then being a collector i also like things that are rare so like hunting them down you know trying to find good deals on stuff uh, and then right. different types of books i go through phases um like i like to collect uh like right now my obsession and it's relatively recent is comic book related art and content and like yes i've been exposed to comic books my whole life but like that's just been very inspiring me right now i haven't purchased as many cds as i usually do um but i have a pretty big collection all around here but yeah um i have a lot of like um tattoo flash books that kind of stuff's inspiring to me too um but yeah that's i, cool. I kind of go through phases yeah, you go through phases and they, you still hang on to it. And and um, I've, I've noticed with me one thing. I, I think having all the stuff that's that's different but somehow connected is just a reflection of what's in my brain. It's so weird because yeah. uh, uh, you know, 
comics and metal go so well together, but then they'll branch out into other things that um, relate, that are relatable, or that relate to each other too. So it's all kind of just flows together. Um, I'm about my headphones are about to die. Let me let me switch those out real quick. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. No problem at all. You had those right on deck, huh? <laughs> What's that? You, to you had those right on deck in terms oh, of the replacements. Yeah, I knew. I knew it would happen. So, <laughs> yeah. cool. Do you have um, any, um, you know, new things from like your comic book haul you mind showing? Anything nearby? Uh, sure. Um, this isn't actually uh, a comic book, but this is um, comic related, and this is a. Uh, the art of of Mad and EC comics. Oh, nice! And uh, actually, Abby <laughs> pointed this out, and I was like, ah, I have to have it. She's really good at spotting things before me. So, uh, you know, and this has just um, some up close shots of the the you know these famous covers. Um, also picked up. Uh, this is really sick right here. This is, I mean, oh, yeah. is just so, uh, yeah. I love the way that he, he blended that, uh, the texture on the face. And then there's still that place where the eyes can rest with a little more solid black. Absolutely. Al, Al Philstein, man. Uh, um, you get Jack Davis. Uh, all these guys were just uh, amazing. Wally Wood. Um, also, are you familiar with Basil Wol Wolverton? I'm not. No. Let me. Uh, well, I didn't bring that one. Let me. Let me. Uh, let me grab that. It's just right over here. Yeah, go for it. Ba Basil, besides Robert Crumb, ba Basil Wol Wolverton is uh, is a huge influence on me. Also. Oh man, I and love that. He um. He is was an underground old comic guy. Not really. He did a lot of stuff for Mad Magazine in the 50s and 60s. And then he went on to just um, kind of just illustrate whatever came his way. He did a lot of comics. He's he's famous for, for this particular um, Mad Magazine cover. Um, mm. I'll, I'll, I'll get you some bigger shots here. He, he's an amazing... Um, with cross hatching and and stippling, just just absolutely one of my favorite artists. Um, so see a good example here of what I'm talking about. But I, I highly recommend you you check his stuff out because it, it's um it's just incredible what he's able to to get uh and pin. Yeah, he has a great eye for texture and breaking things up so they're really Absol readable. Absolutely. Yeah. He's, his stuff is incredibly insane. Um, so yeah, I've been looking at his stuff for, for quite a while. In fact, I think it's because through Robert Crumb mentioning him is what got me into his work. I think I I had like read an interview or something and, and, <laughs> and Robert Crumb was talking about him. And so any book that I could find on, on him, I, I, I would snatch up. Look at this sickness. Look, look, look at that. That's amazing. So, cause I, you know, maybe I'm projecting, but I bet there's a lot of people who would not like that artist at all. Uh, uh, and I, I do like it. I, it just, it seems like it would be a particular person who would love it. And then there'll be a lot of people be like, I don't get this. Uh, you're right. Actually. Um, it, it was very, very, um, either loved or hated. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, uh, he's right up my alley because I love, you know, like artists like Ed Ross also. Yep. Um, he kind of has that, you know, crazy, crazy, I don't know, kind of wild. 
there's some liberating spot. about that type of art, you know? Like it doesn't have to abide by all the rules of nature, but then there's enough in there that you can really read it. I've always been drawn to that stuff too. Me too. It's uh, about crazy design with textures and just a feeling of um, almost something kid-like to it, ch mm -hmm. childlike quality, but executed in a way where, you know, there, there's some draftsmanship behind it, I think is an interesting uh, combination. And, and I think that that pours into my work in, in some some cases, especially when you see me do just single uh, headshot pieces, um, I like to push push the boundaries, you know, with that. So huge influence. Yeah. That was another question. I didn't write this one down, but uh, I don't know if you're still doing it. For a long period of time, you were doing a lot of like Instagram, Instagram live, like drawing all in one session right and you did a lot of like heads during that time mm -hmm. am i mistaken or no you're right um i did one recent they they for some reason i don't know what it is i don't know if it's my setup or they're very you know you ever do something and then and then go back and look at like how how did the fuck how the fuck did i do that because <laughs> yeah i'll look at stuff that i i did in one sitting and 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 s some of those sessions I would do them in one sitting, right? Some yeah. of them I'd have to break it up where I'd have to finish it off camera. But I'll look at some of the ones that I did on camera that I did start to finish, however long it took me. They take different, you know, time links. But um, I, I just, I don't know. I can't, It's it's been difficult for me to sit through sit through them and then get one done. I plan on getting back into that though. Um, maybe simplify a little bit, maybe try something smaller. Um, I find myself getting caught up with what's going on in the comments sometimes too. Yeah. <laughs> Which has been interesting. <laughs> uh, man, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was doing those for a while. I was trying to get on a schedule of doing them. But now it's just whenever I have time and just kind of feel like taking on that challenge. Yeah. But yeah, I plan on, I plan on getting back into, into did you check, check, check them out before? Or, or? I, I just remember all the time being alerted. Cause that's one of the perks of doing the live stuff is if you're a follower, you get alerted. So then okay. I would, I would get the alert. I would maybe be on an errand. I'd pop in. I'd see that you're working on it. I'd come back in later. I'd see the progress. So I think that's the one thing is like, and it's no criticism towards you. It's just like with Instagram Live, because of the nature of the platform, I feel like you tune in for a couple minutes and then you're gone. And it's new person in, out, in, out. Whereas maybe other platforms, it's more, and that, that could just be me. Other platforms, if it's live, I'll be like, okay, I'm dedicated to sitting and seeing this whole thing at one sitting. Uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I do have plans in the future of, of maybe exploring Twitch and YouTube. Yeah. Um, and maybe do more drawing on those. Um, well, I haven't tried e either one of those yet. So, uh, but, but, um, I've kind of looked into them, but, uh, I may, may branch out and do that. Uh, there are some people I've noticed there'll be a couple of diehard people that will sit the whole time through, through my drawing on Instagram yeah. live. Um, but you're right. It's mainly people popping in and out, you know, but. I think it, it's it, just what people go to Instagram for, you know, they want that quick dopamine hit and then they want out like, at least you're, that's you're, how I am. You're, you're right. It does produce some interesting engagement and i think it's cool to 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 do a little bit of drawing in some kind of live situation just to um like i said get that engagement and then just show people how you you know how you think and construct something i love watching artists that i like draw you know definitely um i wish he would 
put something new up because it's been two, three years, but I, I love to watch Frank Cho draw. Um, and he's like a machine. I mean, I don't, I, I I'm amazed at how clean and precise somebody can get just first, just first go at it. Just His boom. First it's, mark. Yeah. Boom. It's, it's on there. It's tight. It, and then, you know, clean and he goes and inks it. Same thing. It's like a machine. But sometimes though, like I was saying earlier, that can be, um, it, it can be really nice and effective, but I think sometimes it, it, depending on the piece, it can kind of stiffen things up a little too much, you know? So I try to keep a balance liveliness and, and, you know, tight stuff, you know, so it's not just too stiff, but you learn from it. You learn from watching people draw. At least I do. Oh, you know, 100%. I, yeah. Do you, um, so some of the people on YouTube that I like watching draw, um, David Finch is one. You watch any of those David, Monday night draws? David Finch is amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I've watched his, he has a little series that he, he does on different lessons and, and, um, that dude's incredible. Yeah. I mean, he seems like such a good person too. Yeah, he really does. He seems super cool. And, and, um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about, about his drawing. He's just, yeah, the dude's a machine. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. There's another channel I found recently and it's, um, part of it's live drawing, but a lot of it's just, it's been helpful for me, like understanding, uh, comic books, the history and all that stuff. There's a guy named Richard uh, Fiend or Friend. Sorry, I, I would need to look, but I think it's, I might be Friend. No, uh, I know but, who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. His cha- I've, I've been enjoying his uh, live streams and stuff on his channel too. Yeah, he, he covers a lot of good stuff. He, um, you know, I like some of his commentary on what he's, you know, he, what, you know, he'll present something and then put his his thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I've watched his stuff too. When you're drawing and inking and stuff, do you typically listen to music, podcasts, put on like a show that you can partially ignore? What do you do? Uh, definitely don't do music anymore. I used to, when I was younger, uh, that was like a really main driving force. If there is any kind of music at all while I'm working, (laughs) It's got to be something that's not going that, that I can kind of just have in the background that it won't spark me to go look for music, <laughs> yeah, or shop for music, or <laughs> or look up something about said band. It has to be something that, in a lot of cases, it might sound funny to some people, but it's usually like '80s pop. Mm-hmm. It has to be stuff that. I'm familiar with that. I, I don't care enough about to get distracted with. It's either that, or um, if it is music, you know, it's either that or soundtracks or weird atmospheric kind of soundscape, you know, stuff. But uh, typically, it's um, yeah, it's like uh, interviews or. Um, documentaries mm-hmm. or yeah just whatever I find on YouTube that I can just kind of put on and, and have as background I don't it, it can't be anything uh, too immersive you know because then I won't draw <laughs> <laughs> yeah you look over a little too much yeah, <clears> but I, t- I typically have something on though yeah yeah, I'll have something on going. Nice. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the best part about being a visual artist in this day and age? Uh, well, I mean, I, coming from a time when there wasn't an internet really to speak of, or especially social media or a platform to, to put your art, uh, up on I think it's a great time um, I mean that's that's what's launched my career really um, people 
you know, I see, I see people complain about algorithms and this, that, and the other. And I mean, I, I guess I understand some of that, but, uh, it, it's a tool you have it there and man, just do the work and post it. We have, you have this thing that, that we can use and, um, I don't know. I feel kind of grateful, actually. You know, I think that's why one reason my career's um, kicked off late in life versus in my early twenties because I, you know, I just had a chance to, I guess, in that time, build it and grow it. But then, when I got my arm twisted to get on Instagram and I listened, uh man, things really just kicked off for me, yep. you know? So I guess that's the best, one of the best, uh, I don't know, th- best things to enjoy in being a, a full-time illustrator. You know, it has, it has its negatives, you know, I'm not saying it's all, you know, peaches and cream, but, but it uh, outweighs the bad in a lot of cases. Uh, for me, I, it's self control. You know, right. like just not getting distracted by the noise and not getting it in the way of producing good work. I think maybe is the potential negative that um, sometimes affects me and other people. Yeah, you. Can, it's easy to also get caught up. In, it's good to pay attention to what others are doing for sure. Uh, you learn from it and you just want to, you know, keep your eyes open and see what's going on. But also it can be distracting and, and negative in a way to get so immersed and wrapped up and worried about, Oh man, you know, am I, am I in the mix with all this, you know? So, mm-hmm that can be the issue too, for some people. I think I, I've almost caught myself kind of getting into that game of, you know, you're just steadily on your phone consuming instead of working. Yeah. And, uh, it's a fine balance, you know, but yeah. Cool. Um, unless there's anything else you want to talk about just right now, I was thinking pulling up some of your work and you can, kind of help me dissect it maybe like some challenges with the piece things that you're still really happy about maybe even the story behind creating it does sound good yeah sounds good let's jump into that all right let me put this up so the first two we have here we have the insect warfare world extermination cover and then uh to the right of it an anthrax related commission for no man correct it was for a, a, oh, not man. Yeah, it was for oh, a, man, sorry, it yeah. was for a Z Z two comics. Yeah, the, the but yeah, it was a book on on a. Uh, it was celebrating the thirty fifth anniversary of uh, Among the Living. Wait, was it that graphic novel that they created, and this was in it? Or yes. Is, okay. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah. So let's take maybe one of these at a time. So. You've, you've spoken a little bit about the insect warfare cover and how that launched your career and um, got you a lot of visibility. And you told a little bit about the backstory, but um, do you recall sure. like how big this piece is and maybe some challenges with it? That piece was drawn in 2007. Mm, excuse me. And um, it's really funny because I, I, looking at that now, I would tackle it completely different uh, and it, would, it w- wouldn't look that way. Um, you know, we're talking almost 16, 17 years ago now. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's very small. That's one thing I, 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 um, I don't have the original anymore. I sold it. I wish I still had that one, but, uh, paying rent was more important at that time. So, but, uh, it's very small from what I remember. I think it's 10 by 10. And, and the reason I remember wow. back then they were saying, man, don't go over 10 inches. Cause you know, it won't fit in the scanner. So I was like, Jesus. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, I drew it that small and, um, yeah, that's, that's basically the, the size of it. Um, 
Yeah. That's yeah, insane it's how small it is. It's very small. It's a small drawing. Um, yeah, it was fun, though. I had fun with it at that time. I, uh, like I said, it would be... Um, I would take that on in a completely different way now because, uh, yeah, I just... There's some similarities to what I'm doing now, obviously, but just the, the, uh, I guess the way I would approach it would be, be a lot different, you know, but, uh, I'm like still, what? I just think that, um, I would have actually taken more care and concern in, in making sure that skyline <laughs> was, was more in perspective with the foreground. And, but you know what though, it adds some, it, the the things that are wrong with that adds to the chaos, I think. Mm -hmm. So I can't pick it apart too much because it's just it's its own thing, and and man, it, it's kind of become a con iconic <laughs> in a way. I've seen more memes and and things done with that thing than anything I've ever done. It's really odd to me. So I guess the things that are wrong with it are, are okay, but yeah, I would. I think I would uh, tackle that skyline a little bit different as far as how I drew it. Mm. Yeah. It, it's amazing when you tell me that's only 10 by 10, because I thought going in, this was one of your largest pieces because of the scale of everything. So right. That's you, really awesome that you're able to pull that together because it's hard for me to even fathom. You know what? You're right, because uh, I think that actually that's more impressive than how I would do it now, because uh, now that I think about it, yeah, man, I don't know how I compacted all that that tiny space like that, but it it worked out. Um, because you're right, I, I would probably go the Shiva size of things, you know, and try to you know make it into this giant epic thing. Um, but it is uh, it is a small drawing for what it for what's you know going on in it sure i think it's really cool too how you did the smoke and then you have those sh shapes and then it goes into the black of the whole background like the um way it kind of frames it up is really nice and then with the logo i recall i have the cd over here but logos at the top right and then their logo kind of has um almost a, that metallica shape to it where there's the edges that go out i drew the logo too yeah okay the the, wow. the logo has a funny story his idea bo he's like um bo is a guitar player and he goes i want the logo to look like a cross between nuclear salt and terrorizer so oh, totally that, that. that's where i went with it with the points you know mm -hmm. and um it sat right above i don't know if you could see that there's that um, line on the mushroom cloud where it turns into the black. It sat right, right above that, I believe. And that helped um, out with the readability. That yeah. Smart design move. Yeah, I kind of framed it. Um, I, in fact, I think so much so that I, I knew it in advance. This was all really planned out. It's really interesting because Bo and I working together, it, it was so awesome how we were just really in tune. He would think of something and, and then I would add to it or vice versa. So with this one, everything was really planned out. Um, I did a couple sketches and the idea was, was like, you know, we want a grim reaper looming over the uh, Houston skyline. That's what that is. That skyline's the Houston skyline. And, you know, we want the Grim Reaper to look like, you know, he's 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 fucked up too. There's just, you know, he's getting blown to bits too. You know, uh, just this kind of apocalyptic kind of vibe to it. So, but I added the mushroom cloud, mm -hmm. and then instead of the the original idea was they wanted random insects, or, or Bo just said to put, you know, all, all varied, you know, just different types of insects and stuff. And then I suggested tree roaches because we had these really huge roaches here in Houston and uh, they fly. 
they fly around. They're, they're pretty. Oh my god, they're pretty crazy. Yeah. So I added those instead of just um, the random bugs because I felt it would, you know, be make it more Houston related. Cool. And um, so it was our combination of ideas. Um, that little building that the roaches are climbing over. Mm -hmm. That's actually based on a spot close to the downtown area that was actually uh, kind of close to some practice rooms that everyone practiced at, but it was really seedy and, you know, that's why it has the, the adult bookstore and, you know, uh, spa and <laughs> uh, stuff like that. Connect but, the dots yeah. from there. Yeah. So, do you remember um, at all how you collected reference for this drawing, or was a lot of it off memory? The buildings were definitely uh, from a picture. Um, and that's where I was saying earlier I would come. I would, I would try to. Well, I think that I would still work from a photograph. I would just try to make it more in line with uh it fitting within the the um the, the environment or mm. picture plane or whatever but uh yeah that's basically the only thing that i reference were those buildings that i actually um uh, printed off the internet back then um i just found a picture of the houston skyline and went off went from that because it's kind of hard to just draw those from just straight memory. Oh, you know, yeah. I would definitely way. go about that way. Yeah. So I use that. But everything else is um, is me, though. Even that building in the foreground uh, and the roaches and the Grim Reaper and everything else. I That's just the whole composition is just my, my idea. Yeah. So. In terms of the uh, not mayor, not man on the right here, uh, one thing I was curious of is um, how do you, do you tackle like putting white back in after you've uh, you know darkened a lot of stuff? Do you have like a technique for that? Like all those little dots and the stippling with the white. Um, is there white stippling in that one? I don't remember. You could uh, either do, you know, go around it or you'd add it in after. I know Riddick used like a jelly roll after the fact. I was curious if he did something similar. Sometimes. Um, with that one, I'm not quite sure. Uh, if I had the piece in front of me larger, I could probably tell. Mm -hmm. But typically what I do is I use, um, I use very different things. Um, sometimes I'll use like white ink. Okay. Uh, it's basically the stuff called actually uh, a lot of manga artists use this for corrections, but what I'll do is I'll take a, uh, I'll take a nib and I'll take some water and kind of dilute this stuff cause it's thick. And then on a scrap paper over black, see where I can get some like, you know, smooth, consistent lines. And I'll use that for my line work or dots against black. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. That's typically what I do. Um, I have used those jelly rolls. Some, if it's something small and quick, I'll use those. But I haven't had that much success with those over my blacks because I think my ink or the ink that I use doesn't really um, – it doesn't help it flow well or something. They can be so, kind of weak. Yeah. Crystal, I've found. I don't. I just don't use them that much. So that's that's typically what I use for white is just that white um, ink, uh, correction ink. Sometimes also, if it's a large chunky area that I just kind of want to uh, sculpt out, I'll, mm -hmm. use, I'll use this thing, which I've used for like 30 years, uh, this, this uh, Presto Pentel correction pen. Yeah, I'll show okay. the I'll show the deleter too since you got me on the yeah these two are for my white oh deleter what, yes I've heard yeah. that before yeah this is great shit man you can draw over it and it dries smooth if you're quick with it and same with this one 
if you're slow with it, it can get chunky. But if, if you if you apply it fast, but both of these, uh, it, you can get some smooth uh, surface to draw over. And um, so I use those for both correction and uh, drawing with ink or white ink, you know. So, so probably to you know to answer your question, long answer. Yeah, I, I probably used uh, either deleter or my whiteout pen. And then if it gets too chunky, you know how you can just go back and sculpt over it with your black, you know? Right. Yeah, so that's, that's what I did. I've been using one of these recently, uh, and I, it does have some flaws to it, but the Posca white markers, uh, I think for me, I like them because they're so convenient, and I don't have to whip out the inks and stuff, but there it does um, raise it up a bit. And right. the white from this is a little different than the just natural Bristol white. So if you're right. reproducing, I think it's fine. But if you're trying to do it absolutely as best quality as possible, there's probably better ways. Right. I, I've, i uh, like I said, on those two, I've had a lot of success and highly recommend them. Yeah. Um, I know some people are completely anti white out, but. Uh, along f as well as corrections, I love to draw with white. So, if you don't like white on your originals? Don't <laughs> don't don't buy mine. Then, not <laughs> not not every single one of them has it, but usually uh, there's going to be a place in there where I'll, I'll I'll like, oh shit, I have to rethink this real quick, and I just bust out the white out to get just get that wiped out and drawn over. Um, yeah, great tool. But, I'll buy some of that deleter stuff. I think yeah, it's great. Deleter's the brand name because they have those. Um, Deleter's the brand name. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I have uh, one of those sheets. Shit, I don't know the word, but once again, like um, manga artists use them, where there's all those like uh, like Zipatone, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'll look into that. So, in terms of this piece, um, tell me a little bit about that. The anthrax piece exactly yeah yeah okay um that was uh what happened with that was um a guy that, that um his name's ian saddler i think is his last name yeah ian uh bought a couple pieces from me and then later told me hey you know i, I used to be the editor for dc comics I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know. And I, I looked his name up, and sure enough, he was. You know, people say things, you know. And, right. uh, so you know, we kept in touch, and and uh, he's you know just a really cool guy, and he he um he knows people, and and uh, he's friends with Scott Ian, and around the time that uh, they were putting that book together, kind of last minute, he reached out and said, hey. I think I could get you a because I think he he's not a full time editor anymore, but I think every once in a while he'll he'll get in on, on a job where he can kind of be an editor or art director. I think I'm I'm not sure quite what his his main gig is, but on this one he was somewhat of an art director, I think, and he reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in in actually illustrating. Uh, a comic strip for one of the what, what they did was every song was going to be a short comic okay based on the lyrics uh what happened was they couldn't get me lined up with a writer or something or a script for me I, i'm not sure and, th and then it just turned into like i think three or four spot illustrations and plus that that large uh not man piece that we're talking about here for a full page illustration and i said yes absolutely and um i don't think there was any props or 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 uh briefs on it other than we want you know a full full page not man zombie illustration and that's what i came up with and that's first what they got first sketch that that i turned in was approved right away um there were minor changes only later 
on the skateboard, there's some things that they took out, but other than that, um, it was a go. So it was a lot of fun to do and, um, really cool opportunity. You know, and I, I still think he to this day. I mean, it was really cool. The same year he got me, um, a gig doing a garbage pail. Oh, nice. Kid does, uh, uh, illustration for, for a garbage pail kid. So I got to pick my own uh, out of a list, pick which garbage pail kid I wanted to do. And, um, yeah, he lined that up too. That was like yeah. a zombie one too, right? He's right. Like crawling out. Very similar. Yeah. Yeah. I like zombies. So that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, that's the, that's the story with that. You know, it's super cool. I grew up with, you know, listening to anthrax and, uh, yeah, it's just an awesome opportunity. When you said they made the edits on the skateboard, were those digital edits or were you asked to make those edits and use like white ink for correction? I didn't have time uh, for what they, what they wanted. I couldn't do in the um, that quick. So I think it was a digital edit. Okay. Um, but they did it well. I mean, I, I can't even tell really when I look at it. So, um, whoever did it, did it, did a good job. So nice. Yeah. So then we got two here. Um, we got the agnostic front. Is that a t-shirt design? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, this thing on the right, is this one of your own creations? No, that's based on a, um, um, uh, a creature from Warhammer. Okay. Called a great and clean one. Super into Warhammer stuff, and that was either one I did for fun or commission. Um, I, I kind of got to where people started asking for those, so I did like three or four of them, and then sometimes I'll do one on my own, and it'll sell. So people like my interpretation of, of those, I guess. But uh, but yeah, that's from Warhammer. Very cool. Well, let's and, start with the agnostic front. That's cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's really weird. I, I did some agnostic front. I actually, somebody commissioned me to do that agnostic front demon mm -hmm. as, um, yeah, as a commission and I did it and they posted it. And I think Roger Merritt saw it, the singer from agnostic front. And he reached out to me and asked, um, me if I'd be interested in doing a shirt design. And I said, absolutely. And, um, yeah, he's super cool to work with. Um, I mean, easy to, yeah, easy to work with. Um, just, it was a joy to work on. Um, yeah. So it was an additional drawing or did you use that same commission drawing and license it to him? Oh, no, no. This was a, this is, um, separate from that he hired me to do a, a one specifically for them oh okay yeah. yeah 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 he had just saw the commission and thought it was a good take on their their character so he he reached out to me to to to, to draw one for them you know for their shirt so, so yeah was it just like in their web store or was it related to a tour do you know it was in their web store for a while and then they sold it on, I, I think a couple tours. I don't know if they still have it in print. Um, but yeah, I think that, yeah, maybe they were about to hit the road at that time and, and, um, he just needed some, a, a new merch design. And I just happened to get into his radar at that time, at that point. So, I yeah, I, I couldn't say no. I love I love early agnostic front. That's uh, you know, it's super huge to me. So I, I had to. I, I couldn't say no. Roger's a great guy. That's so, good to hear. Yeah. In terms of getting your work ready for print and digitally, um, are you using a scanner and then uh, doing any light touches in Photoshop just to get it ready for print? How does that usually work? Uh, the only thing I do is scan stuff in and send it to the client. 
I don't do any kind of computer work. I have zero digital uh, knowledge. I, I just, not to say that I won't one day, yeah. but uh, yeah, that's just not my, not my world, man. So what uh, you see is exactly what you hand drew. Nothing. Right. No, I don't work digitally at all. I just don't. Uh, the only thing that I would use it for, like you said, is like to maybe kind of clean it up for print. But I don't do that part. Usually in the past, I've either had help with that or the client just understands that what they're going to get from me is a raw scan. Okay. And they to kind of take it from there. Um, I know some people will probably cringe at that thought, <laughs> but, but I just, man, I don't. Yeah, I just have a problem with with computer stuff, man. I, I don't know. I need to figure that out one day. But just right, I'm just worried about the drawing. That's that's it. Yeah, it's work. It's worked for me this far, and that's what I'll, I I just worry about that, you know. And then the rest just figure out. But um, yeah, no, no, I, that, that's that makes that a lot works. of sense to me. Um, so then with this, you said it was the unclean one, right? That's what it's called. Great and clean one. Yeah. Great and clean one. Yeah. So, you know, with this one, so it's on white bristles. So you didn't do the, um, you know, black background or anything. Right. When, how do you typically make that, you know, decision? Like just keep it on the stark white or on the black? Is it just an instinct to gut thing or I don't know. I'm just mm, kind of curious. That's a good question. Um, I like to mix things up a bit. Um, sometimes it won't be either solid black or solid white. If you've noticed in some of my pieces, I'll have crazy, you know, backgrounds with like yeah. different fades of misty smoke or, or um, maybe there'll be different objects in the background or figure work. But for a stark white background, I guess when I came to that decision was that to me, if I know that I'm going to do a, just a solid wall of stippling, that looks so good to me on a white background. Mm -hmm. It just does. It gives it that the soft gray look when you stand back. Like right now, it's tiny on my, my screen and I'm looking at it. And it's still very visible and clear to me. But it has like, uh, it's those tonal grays kind of work good against a white background it's yeah. almost like when you see a a, a a graphite drawing a value drawing yeah. pencil drawing you know on white background i think has the same effect to my eyes anyway I so that's how that. that's how i make the decision and that's not to say i don't do solid stippling against black but that's how i arrive to that decision usually it's like oh it's just this one thing but I want to do it all stipple, no other technique. It'll just look really good against the white to me. And, um, yeah, that, that's how that usually comes into play. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. Personally, what do you like best about this drawing? So you mentioned a couple things that you like about it, but I don't know. I always uh, like to hear what other artists think of their own work to a certain degree. I do like that one a lot. Uh, there was another one that I did that, well, no, this is a good one to pick because one thing that I did different that you don't see in the IP, the original that mm -hmm. much or at all, really. I'm ne I did like, if you see his legs, I kind of did them as like kind of frog like yeah. hind legs a little bit. And they usually have more humanoid looking legs, you know, it's like a more like a, just a fat person squatting. So I like, I kind of like that touch that I added. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's my favorite part of it. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm really happy with that drawing. Um, it's you fun know, to do. Okay recall roughly how long something like this would take you that wasn't that big so that one took me 
uh, roughly a couple nights. Yeah. Not even like. Uh, yeah. Maybe like a day and a half total uh, of work. Yeah. Something like that. Didn't take that long. Yeah, for me, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. I love the texture of it. And then when you don't have anything in the background, it accentuates the profile. So you just see where everything begins and ends really well. Um, uh, yeah, I, so I've, I've overheard people. I uh, can't think of any specific situations or where or when, but I've heard uh, um, not just other artists, but I think people, um, the viewers, so to speak, kind of be concerned about just a white, stark, blank background. Almost like if it's an artist, they're kind of scared of that or mm -hmm. think it's unfinished. It's kind of same viewpoint from other people but like again to me or just like you just pointed out it really helps with the shape i think it makes things clear if you're not doing a an illustration with um a setting or with some kind of narrative behind it and you're just doing an object i think it works great you know yeah. I, I, I i love it i don't have a problem at all with with white backgrounds. Um, I do it a lot in my work actually. Now, when you go to get to something printed or repurpose it for something else, uh, you might, you might have some problems kind of working that in, but a lot of times you can work a piece, uh, to where it will work both in white or black background. If, yeah. If you, if you put that in your head before you draw it. So, um yeah but yeah white backgrounds rule man i i i i use you know a really detailed piece just just looks good that way sometimes you know so so these two i i kind of pair together um i think both of them were photos that you took of your work but i really like the um you know the heads like we were talking a little bit earlier mm -hmm. and there's two different kind of styles showcased here as well that are both your own, of course, but you, you tackle them in different ways. Um, so you mind talking a little bit about both of these? Yeah. I'm glad you paired these because um, I'm, I'm kind of going through this thing where I want to take um, uh, like, um, I guess like, you know, you would have in fantasy or sci-fi, you know, a female lead or character mm -hmm. and just trying to um, put my own spin on that. And uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess there is a, some different techniques in both. Um, and that may be because of the different subject matter, but, um, I don't know. Do you want to know, like if I approached each one, each one, um, uh, well, like there's different design choices. So, and this is from my perspective, right? So okay. for the one on the left, there's a inherent softness to how you did her facial features. And then with the one on the right, it's got more of a bold kind of design uh. choice. So I thought that was really cool that, you're like, no, with this one, I want to have that solid shadow hitting the eye going into the nose. Yeah. Whereas the other one, it's more like, um, it's it's very subtle, and I, I think it's cool how you're doing both because uh, they both have strengths. You know. Oh, okay. Now, now I know how to answer that. Uh, the one on the right, the, the kind of cyberpunky, sci-fi looking one. Yeah. To me, made sense to have hard, harsh edges edges and that stark contrast because of the the i think it adds to the um to the um uh mechanical almost mm -hmm. vibe of it uh, very um industrial um very um uh, you know 
just yeah uh kind of harsh you know and then that other one it's not like so much that it's softer in the in the in um intensity of of the subject matter because you know she's powerful and she's got this crazy it's very intricate evil helmet you know but it's organic so to me it made sense to soften her face up more than the other one to kind of show it's kind of weird that you're pointing that out too or it's interesting because um it makes it excuse me it makes sense because i wasn't like thinking that way to, to, to uh when i was doing them individually you know what i mean like mm -hmm. So I guess it worked out. <laughs> well, it's an intuitive but, thing. You did it right. without thinking about it. Right, right. That's interesting. That's awesome you point that out because, uh, um, yeah, having that, that other viewpoint, I'm looking at it. Now I'm explaining why I did, did something, which is, which is you know, the, those choices. You know, you don't think about how to explain those choices when you're doing it. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah. But I guess that's that's what would make sense to me. One is like harsh and mechanical and stark, I guess, and then the other one is more organic. Mm -hmm. I would say so. That would probably be the reason why there's differences. I love uh, uh, so a couple like just technical things I love about each one. So the. Um, one on the left, the more intricate kind of one. If I recall right, I remember this one took a little bit of time for you. But uh, if I remember right, did you do ink washes for those wing parts of the helmet? No, or you're thinking you're thinking of another. You're, yeah, I did do some ink wash. Actually, I can pull that out and show you um, in a bit here if you'd like. But sure, it was yeah. a it was a helmet uh, skull. It was a skull and a helmet. And the, 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 the skull was actually full stipple and the entire helmet was ink wash, including the I wings. I think I remember now. Yes. I can show you here in a bit. That's a great piece. Um, I'm really happy with that one because of the contrast of the ink wash against the, the, um, just, just the wall of stippling looks, looks, um, it was a really good effect. Yeah. But there's no ink wash in, in the, um, the, uh, yeah. The, girl with the the goat helmet thing yeah and the, the the beauty of it too is there's so each piece of the helmet has a slightly different texture so they're all readable on their own they obviously all relate to each other and then the face just having it i'd have to really zoom in Did, was it mostly a really soft stipple effect that you used for that face yes okay yeah really small stippling built up like just um, knowing when to stop that, like not overworking it, especially after how many hours you already put in that, I think was a, oh, that's a master dude. move. You know what I mean? It was an insane, uh, you know, if you remember, I did the face last, which freaked a lot the of people pressure, out. Man. <laughs> it freaked a lot of people. I had some artist friends of mine t tell me as I was working on that, like, dude, we were on the edge of our seats seeing that you waited to do the face last after all that work. And I wasn't even thinking about it. Now, now that I look back, at it, I was like, wow, that <laughs> it's a ballsy like, move. Well, and you know, it makes sense though. I do remember running into some problems with the eyes and I'm like, fuck, you know? So now I see what they were talking about. I do remember now that I think about it, I did have some problems with the eyes, but it worked out. Um, I'm really happy with that. that started off as a personal piece that I wasn't even trying to sell, but ended up, you know, uh, being a commission that someone paid me to finish basically. Yeah. Um, I expect so that one would have grabbed up pretty quick. It, it immediately, it was in sketch form when, when somebody, um, reached out and said, I want that, I want to buy it. And I named the price and it was sold. Hell yeah. So, yeah. Which makes it even scarier because now that I look back on it with as much time that I spent 
on everything besides the face before I touch the face. So, um, yeah, I'm happy it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. Yeah. The, uh, the way you did the hair on the right side, I thought was really nice too. You know, hair is inherently difficult because it has form yet it has a lot of like small texture and stuff too. And I think you got that balance, right? Especially oh, thanks, the way man. the, uh, it's so soft at the top where it's hitting the solid black. I like that there's that fuzzy feeling on the edges and it's not too, um, just stiff. I thought that was right. really nice. Right. Thanks, man. Yeah. I, I really made a conscious effort on that. So it makes me happy you, you point that out. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, hair can be challenging. I agree. I mean, it's, uh, it's that flowiness, uh, or it, well, in this case, I mean, of course it's, it's, um, it's like a triple hawk. It's gelled up or whatever the fuck yeah. they do to that hair. But, but, uh, it's still got, has to have that organic quality and flow to it to be hair, to translate his hair with line. So, Yeah. It's cool how you you framed it too with that. Uh, I guess that would be a rectangle, not a square. But the way that you did that, um, so that it you know leaves the frame. If you just right. had that, you know, well, if you just had on black background, then you wouldn't have been able to make that choice for the bottom part of the mohawk, which is darker. So right. you set yourself up for. You're thinking like a graphic designer as much as an illustrator, in my perspective on that one, which was cool. Thank you. I, I think um, actually my work is kind of leaning more towards this weird mix of, of graphic art with illustration, yeah. and that's fine with me. I, I but yeah, that you're right. That is a, more of a graphic design choice. Um, it works. I, I I was really happy with that one. Um, I still have that original, by the way. So <laughs> nice. Anybody yeah. wants to hit them up? Yeah, they hit me up. <laughs> All right. And then I think, yep, this is the last slide. So I wanted to hear a little bit about each of these, which are both very different, but um, they, they showcase different things that we haven't touched on yet. Sure. Yeah. The one on the left there, uh, the Halloween pumpkins on the, the um, staircase there. Mm -hmm. That was a commission from a collector uh, and he wanted a, um, you know, Hey, I want a scene of almost demonic, demonically possessed pumpkins on a, on like a staircase, like a, almost like a kid's approaching a house to go trick or treat at, but he's looking up at it and it's just too scared to walk up mm -hmm. to go knock on the door type feeling. I like the idea a lot. So that's, you know what I went with. It's a cool and, camera uh, perspective for sure. Thanks. Yeah. I looked at several different reference photos and kind of combined a couple different ones to, to, to achieve, you know, that feeling of a, just a really run down uh, house and, and went crazy with the webbing because I love to draw webs. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that was a fun one. Really fun Do you one. recall how big you made that one? That one's 11 by 17. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then this one on the right. Um, was this used for Black Dahlia Murder, or am I getting it mixed up? No, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they um, actually the band personally didn't reach out to me, but somebody that works with them did. And uh, super cool to work with. Is this related to the Verminous tour, if you recall right? Because they had a lot of like a rat and sewer theme at the time. I don't remember the name of the tour. It was. Um, I, I'm not a I'm not a uh, I'm not a Black Dahlia Murder fan, so I wasn't even really I heard the name, but I I was not at all 
uh, familiar with the music other than just a few things I'd heard throughout the years, but uh, mm-hmm. super cool guy. I did talk to the, um, the singer briefly. He passed away though. Rest in peace, Trevor. Yeah. Right. And he was a super cool guy. Um, but the, the, the image comes from a song they had, um, uh, something about, uh, uh, Something steak, oaken, or, or I don't remember the name of the song. It's got to be on Verminous because I, I think I remember seeing this design and that was like the general theme of the art and uh, a lot of the song titles. I'd have to look at my copy, but they, um, the, yeah, the brief they gave me was just, uh, hey, we want a, um, a skeleton and a, and a coffin full of rats and, we want him with his arms crossed with a stake through his chest. And I immediately saw it in my head and already knew the angle and, and that it would be half of a coffin. Mm-hmm. Um, everything was already d- d- just in talking to them. I knew how I would tackle it. I sent the rough sketch. There was only one minor edit and it was, it was good to go. And yeah, it was quick, easy, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. I actually enjoyed working with them. Nice. And uh, like I said, Trevor was cool. I've talked to him only briefly, but he was a really cool dude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate, but um, he actually was living in Atlanta, so that's where I'm from uh, when he oh, passed. Okay. And he was living there for like a year, and I could have easily met him at a show because he'd go to a lot of the underground shows and it just, it never lined up, but um, yeah, that's kind of a bummer, but I did buy some uh, shirts from him actually. So oh, I okay. own a couple of his personal shirts that he would like wear on tour and stuff. He was oh, just awesome. kind of empty in his closet, but uh, yeah, he, he, yeah. he made a big impression on the underground and got a lot of people who maybe were only familiar with the bigger bands interested in the underground because he was very tapped into it so huge well, that is, that's good man i give respect for that you know uh somebody that can kind of you know uh not let go of their roots and and uh make them visible and it, it keeps that part of it strong you know because that's where i come from and and i want to you know i think it's cool for people to showcase that you know it's for sure um but yeah man that was a great experience i had fun drawing that and um it's cool they made a glow in the dark version of it too which i thought was which was cool i thought but uh yeah man like i said i i um don't don't know anything about the band i i can't say that i'm a fan but i I really enjoyed that opportunity and and um, they were super cool to work with yeah Nice. Um, so there were a couple of things that you had right over there that you wanted to show the Shiva piece. And I was curious to see that ink wash one. Yeah. I'll, I, right there. Yeah. I can, I can, uh, grab that, that, uh, ink wash one. Um, but, but I have the Shiva piece right here. If you want to see that first. Yeah. Um, here's the, the front of it. Uh, it comes in two pieces. Uh, this is pretty much all stipple. I don't know if that can. You whip out the ruler to get all those rays, you know, in a good clean line, or I, a lot of it eyeballed. I, uh, some eyeballed, some, uh, some with a ruler. You're you're correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. I don't know if you could see the the transition of showing what's lit and then underneath the darker points like tra- making the rays transparent was challenging for me mm-hmm. um you can kind of see it in the 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 bull's head up here too uh, see that's yeah. an example of how black and white actually is more challenging than color whereas you could actually probably convey that easier in color to a certain degree having like that translucency or at least i would have a vision of how to do it Whereas with this, it's all try not to have too much of the wrong texture. Right, right. Um, that's the front part. 
And then the back, I'll show that separately and then try to line them up together here. But this is the other side of it. Um, more deathly. Yeah. The story goes is like, Shiva, this is this this is illustrating Shiva's wedding procession, and apparently he he um, on the way to his wedding had every vile uh, person, entity, creature in his wedding procession. Like it was everything from like your average petty street criminal to. Uh, demonic entities and uh, the undead and witches and all this stuff. And, um, you know, this was what he was doing to impress his bride and his bride's uh, parents of which I forget the name of, of her, but um, interesting little uh, story. And I learned a lot <laughs> trying to draw this thing I, I don't even remember how long it took me but it, it took at least a couple of months um i don't know if you can catch the scale of that yeah i think but i think i got it here that's that's awesome it's pretty freaking huge what are um, the lessons you think you learned from it uh i had a good little little lesson in perspective because I had to get a grid that worked with with looking kind of looking up yeah and making everyone kind of fit in the picture plane of somebody that's you know riding a bull and then make it to where it makes sense with everyone uh, in the same picture plane that that was kind of that was kind of a challenge. So that grid had to be correct for those proportions. Um, that was a lot of just trial and error with the sketch work, but yeah, you know, and then I learned a little bit about Hindu mythology, uh, read up on some things and kind of funny in drawing that I got into a lot of Hindu instrumental stuff Mm -hmm. Um, like, um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Rami Shakir, Ravi Rami, Shankar, Ravi Shankar. Yeah. And, and, um, a lot of other stuff like that. A lot of, a lot of Hindu, uh, hy hymnals and, um, just to get me in that mood and kind of inspire me. So that was fun. That, that, that kind of in a weird way. Um, just kind of became an influence, you know, so we could, almost like a daily ritual, putting that stuff on and, and working out and then coming back. And then, you know, nice. after, after a shower, hit the drawing table, but yeah, sweet, good stuff. I got that ink. I could show you that, uh, helmet piece real quick too. Yeah. If you please. Want. Yeah. This is actually part two of a of a uh, uh, commission piece. Oh, that's bigger than I expected. Nice. Yeah, it's 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 pretty huge, man. But that's this is where all the ink wash is here. Mm -hmm. in, the, in this spot, well, it's all backwards. But, um, down in here. Did you? Uh worry about getting the right balance of water to ink over each of all your sessions or it just kind of naturally worked itself out as you were going. Does that uh, kind of make sense? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, there were times where 
You know, and you can't just throw white out on something like this because ink wash doesn't go over white out. Yeah. So it was very tricky. Um, to save it, what I if if it was early enough, you could dab um, a dry paper towel mm -hmm. over where you think you're fucking up, and then go back over as soon as you can. But it was a trick, man. Um, I really like the contrast of like I was saying earlier. This this whole skull here is stipple, and then everything around it is where the the ink wash is so the way the cheekbones pop out is is really nice thanks yeah it was, it was uh really challenging but fun to do um uh, yeah that's sick um and you didn't really have any issues with warping the bristle working with a little bit of water in there no um y you're right you can uh, but it was just the water was like really, um, it's really light with the yeah. water. You know, you don't do it heavy. You, this is for the same guy. Just to kind of take the <laughs> taking the liver here to show you this other one that. that oh, I'm, that's incredible. And the um, is that one finished? No, no. I've got a little more work to do in this figure. Yeah. And there's a couple more like that down guy. here. Yeah. But uh, I'm actually going to leave them pr predominantly white, though, the, the, the human figures, just to make them stand out. Yeah, smart. Uh, light, light shading in them, not, not so they don't blend into all the other grays. Um, but, yeah, it's, that's for the same guy, the, 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 that helmet. Um, this one I'm doing for the same guy. That's a, a very cool project. I always love that like medieval demon kind of influence where they got like the belly, you know, I love that stuff. Like that shit's so cool. Yeah. I never get tired of that. It's just, so, yeah, it's awesome. It's a great design element, you know, that creeps into other things that I draw for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have one more question, but before we get to that, anything else you wanted to touch on? Um, and that's, I don't know. I know you'd asked me like how I got the opportunity with Spencer's and. Yeah. How that, did that come to fruition? Yeah. Um, that basically came about through somebody from a licensing company reach out to me just randomly and asked um, if I would be interested in providing work to, to be sold on a retail level which I immediately jumped on because beforehand I was always trying to put my own t-shirts out and stuff, but the logistics of that can get really difficult. Yeah. Um, but it kind of goes back to what I was, the reason I bring that up is because it goes back to the point I was making on our phone call beforehand, you know, if there's something I want to add or touch on. It's just to do the work because had I not been just cranking pieces out, I mean, it wouldn't have gotten noticed. So regardless of how many likes you get or if someone asks you for a job or you don't sell anything, which I've been there multiple times throughout my career, I just kept cranking workout no matter what. And that's the key. And I'll continue to do so because, you know, I think there's just always levels to, 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 to work towards and gain, you know? So yeah, that's how that came about. They just literally have someone that scours Instagram looking for people to work with. And that's, you know, I don't know about you, but I get emails constantly about offers and different this, that, and the other. And a lot of it looks kind of scammy. Right. So I wasn't too sure with them first, but after I Googled the name and saw who they're working with and what they've done, it was a no brainer. So, um, it's just an example of 
doing your work no matter what just having that initiative to, to to just do your art and stay on it and good things will happen yeah yeah well that was my last question was any advice you'd have for somebody you know starting out um let's say their drawing chops are decent and to get to that next level you have some points there from the business side but maybe uh do you have any other maybe from just a purely technical or artistic side for somebody like that um from a technical standpoint uh i guess my my outlook on it will always be drawing so I'll, just from that perspective i would say um draw every day not just when you have an opportunity or, or just when you feel like it not that you want to force yourself to do something uh because that doesn't always produce the best results but to just get in the habit to go to your drawing table every day and tackle something i think is the best advice i could give and then along the way the technical things will will um work themselves out in the work you know well, absolutely man yeah draw your ass off <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, cool so uh for anybody watching please like and subscribe to this video or subscribe to my channel like the video but of course um daniel has a website he has the web store through spencer's as well so you can pick up some merch there please find him on instagram he's posting every day and um daniel it's been a, a true honor i really appreciate how transparent and humble you've been and of course from a you know just artistic perspective i've been a fan of your work for a long time so it's really cool to have uh you know a conversation Thanks, like this with somebody who i've been seeing his work and been um inspired by for quite some time thank you for the opportunity lee i love what you do love the channel and um you know i'm here to spread the word <laughs> sounds good so, we'll go ahead and yeah. stay on just for a second but everybody else take care have a good day see ya thanks